have you ever seen a puppy just getting a tad too possessive over a toy or maybe their food? And you thought to yourself, oh, that's so cute. Look at that puppy guarding that giant toy. Well, it might be something that's very cute when a puppy is small, but it's a much bigger issue when it turns into an 80 pound dog. And in fact, 20% of dogs have an issue called resource guarding. And if you don't deal with it early on, you can find yourself in a situation where your dog has given someone a serious bite. So we're going to tackle this tough topic today to keep not only you safe, but your dog as well. So let's explore this together. You're listening to Starlight Pet Talk, a podcast for pet parents who want the best pet care advice from cat experts, dog trainers, veterinarians, and other top pet professionals who will help you live your very best life with your pets. We also share inspiring rescue and adoption stories from people who've taken their love of pets to the next level by getting involved in animal welfare. My name is Amy Castro, and I'm the founder and president of Starlight Outreach and Rescue and a columnist for Pet Age magazine. I've rescued thousands of animals and helped people just like you find the right pet for their family. My mission is to help pet parents learn all the ways that they can care for, live with, and even have fun with their pets so they can live their very best lives and their pets can too. Joining us today on the show is Will Bangura, an internationally renowned certified dog behavior consultant with more than 35 years experience. An expert in addressing a wide range of canine behavioral issues, Will is going to bring an evidence-based approach to our discussion today, enriched by his extensive background as not only an author, but host of the acclaimed Dog Training Today podcast. His work, deeply rooted in scientific principles, offers invaluable insights for pet guardians, seeking to understand and enhance their relationships with their canine companions. Will, welcome to the show. Good to be here, Amy. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate you making the time to do this with me today because this issue of resource guarding comes up. I mean, I've been doing animal rescue and, you know, volunteering in a shelter for probably 15 years now. And I'm a longtime animal person. I work for a vet in high school, things like that. And it's, it's, to me, one of those topics that, uh, you know, kind of can start off seeming like it's almost funny. Like I said in my teaser, it's like, oh, isn't that cute? We even get kittens that'll, you know, slam their feet down and guard a bowl of food from the other kittens. And it's, it's funny, <laughs> but yeah. it wouldn't be so funny if it's an 80 pound pit bull or, uh, you know, Great Dane or whatever it might be. So I really wanted to kind of take people through the process of understanding it, um, knowing how it develops, what they can do about it, if anything, obviously with working with a professional trainer like yourself. But before we dive into that, I, I'm always curious when I have people on the show, how did you get into this? like, And, and, how, oh, and why wow. specifically this interest in this topic? Because that's why I yeah. sought you out. Sure, sure. Um, do you have a couple days? No. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I I started out like probably a lot of trainers. Um, I was a kid who loved dogs. My dad was into dogs. Um, I had a dad that was raising German shepherds, breeding German shepherds, and training and competing in AKC obedience uh, matches. Now, this was back mid-70s, early 80s. Things were very different back then. Mm -hmm. Uh, Everything was about force and uh, coercion. So, Training methods, styles, philosophies, a lot has changed since then. That's that's where I got my start and my love uh, for all of it. And then I went to school. I got my bachelor's degree and my master's degree in psychology. I did a little bit of time working as a therapist. And I worked in a psych hospital. I worked in a drug and alcohol rehab place. I did outpatient psych. And I wasn't happy with it. Mm -hmm. I, I was like, no, this, this just isn't for me. Okay. So I'm like, what do I do now? What do I do with this degree now? And I went back to my first love. And so then I started to take some courses specifically on animal behavior. Cause my background was more in, you know, human behavior mm-hmm. and then the rest is history. Yeah. That kind of leads me, well, number one, the first thing you did was trigger a horrific memory as a child Uh now that you said 70s and dog (laughs) training and how it's changed. We used used to have this boxer named Bootsy and she she was a runner. Like if that door was open. You're not going to, you know what? You're going to tell me the same story I could tell you about my dad and our dog, Max. I know how this, I know how the story goes, but go ahead. Well, uh, well, part of the story was that was the trainer. I remember my, my parents finally got fed up with it because she was terrorizing the neighborhood. And, um, 
uh, the only thing I can really remember about this trainer is him literally like with a choke chain lifting oh, her he up a little different off the ground you know between the the brutal tactics like you said the like just oh, totally manhandling dogs back in the back in the day and thinking that's gonna yeah. work with aggression and then just giving up on it i just you know looking back on it now it's like there's so many other things we could have done or tried or whatever it might be that just weren't even part of the equation it was about dominating the dog until it was yeah. terrified of you so that it listened to you sure that's when it's 20 feet away going down the street. It's not coming back when you're calling it, when it's terrified. Oh, exactly. And we had a dog like that when I was a kid, Max. And Max was a runner. He would take off. And my dad was frustrated. And so next thing you know, he's got a shock collar on the dog. Hmm. And that was going to be the answer, right? The dog's not going to run away. So the dog takes off. He hits the button on the remote. All I can remember is the dog screaming and yelping and jumping up off the ground. And rather than say, hey, I shouldn't run away and come home, the dog ran further and faster Yeah, away. I mean, okay, yeah. So that just, didn't work really well. No. And, but, and, but and yeah, I, lots changed for, thank goodness. We see, I see a lot of people running around with the shock collars. And I oh, can't. Oh, we've got a lot of work We've got the, that could be a whole nother podcast. We've got Maybe another, we <laughs> we've got a lot of work to do. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, crazy industry, this dog training industry that's not regulated. Yeah. And that's, yeah, that's One part of it. I mean, it's such not. a wide range of knowledge and experience. And that's, you know, for those who are listening, so important to, to choose wisely and do your homework. Not, not only, you know, it's like for you, obviously as somebody that's got a master's and, you know, I value education, the fact that you've gone through the trouble of, of, taking all these certifications, you know, that's, that's a piece of it. Not everybody has to have, I don't think all that alphabet soup, but sure. I think, Absolutely. I think you really need to understand before you take your dog to a trainer is, you know, understand what is the philosophy and methodology? Um, because we even had a, a German shepherd that we recently adopted out and it, it didn't, it wasn't ours originally. It went through a trainer and it basically came to us with the shock collar and the, and the clicker. And, uh, you know, not having done a whole lot of research that on that because I've never done that before. I tested the shot collar. It wasn't like it was, it was barely, a, you know, you could feel a little tingle on your hand, but it wasn't like it was blasting the dog out of its right. skin. But at the right. same time, I, what I always thought was, that's the only thing controlling the dog. So what if the collar's not on? Or what if it's not working? Or what if the battery- Well, what like, if the dog doesn't listen at that low level? Exactly. Now you're going to crank it up, right? And exactly. eventually you're going to hit maximum capacity. And yeah. so it's just, um, I just have always thought there's got to be, got to be a better way. Um, well, you know, because I started so early and, and there's been so many changes in the way we train dogs, you know, I, I did all that stuff. I used prong collars. I used electronic collars because I've been training for a long time and, and those things were more in vogue, you know, uh, mm -hmm. today, I think, you know, modern dog trainers, people that are educated today that have chosen to educate themselves that understand the science that's out there. No modern dog trainer uses those tools today. They're just unnecessary. Uh, right. But like I said, we could do a whole nother podcast because it, it also goes into wanting to get things done fast. Mm. And there's a financial benefit for dog trainers to want to get things done fast. Yeah. Um, and that's where we start talking about ethics and animal welfare. And where do you balance that? Yeah, you're in business. You need to make money as a trainer. All right. Mm -hmm. But at what cost? Yeah. What and that's, cost to the dog? Right. That's Yeah, that's so true. And and there's, you know, there's two sides to that coin, too, is that the consumer, the the pet parent, pet guardian, pet owner, whatever terminology we want yeah. to use, they want it done fast and they don't want to have to do the work. And I'll, I, right. I will 100 percent admit I, I am lazy as all get out. My dogs are mm -hmm. not, you know, I've got some dogs I can take out in public and some dogs. It's, yeah. it's just, you know, it's, they just be too excited. It's not like they're going to be aggressive to people, but they're just like out of control. But what I've done with them is it works for our life here. And I think that's, you know, understanding what kind of lifestyle you're going to live with that pet. Like, does my dog need to know to heal? No, because I yeah. mean, she spent her entire life off leash with me walking around this property and, you know, she stays within three feet of me. If I tell her, you know, go on or yeah, she'll go and run around, but she comes back when I call her. I don't have to call her twice, you know, unless she doesn't hear me. But I mean, it was, once she's got my, I've got her attention, she comes right back. So do I care that she heals? No, but I, yeah. but I think what happens with pet parents is they get super excited about the puppy 
and they may or may not get involved in training it. So they'll go to a puppy kindergarten and they've taught it to sit and they've taught it to stay ish <laughs> and they've taught it yeah, to come ish, yeah. ish. And, um, and then they think they're done with the process. And then when problems yeah. crop up, they don't want to follow, you know, they don't, they want to ship it off somewhere, get it taken care of, and then have it come back and not have to follow through. So I think yeah. we're just very inconsistent as human beings and we're lazy. Let's, let's bring it back to the, to this issue of, of, yes. re, of resource guarding. So how does, how does that all kind of start or women, you know, cause I know I've seen, we've had litters of puppies, you know, a dog has 10 puppies, you know, nine puppies in the beginning, they all sort of seem the same. And then the personalities yeah. get a little bit different. And then you get that one where you can see their resource guarding. And it's, it's so interesting for anybody who's ever had a chance to see how the mom manages those behaviors. It's very interesting, but what, what should pet parents, I get a new puppy, I bring it home. When does that all start to become an issue that I should be, you know, turning in my attention? Well, to? I think the first thing when, when we talk about resource guarding that we need to say is that it's a very natural canine behavior. Mm -hmm. I, I think there are so many people that are surprised when a dog displays resource guarding, like, Oh my God, it, it, it you know, it's amazing how, quite frankly, amazing how little that we see, even though I don't want to minimize it. There's a lot of it out there. But when it comes, when you take a look at the genetics of dogs and the fact that, you know, for most of their evolution, they're in an environment where resources are scarce mm. and they're having to protect them. They're having to fight for them. So that's a normal canine behavior. However, you know, with tens of thousands of years of evolution and domestication, you know, a lot of that has been bred out of the dogs, but it's still part of the makeup of, of a canine. And there are some breeds that are going to be a little more predisposed, you know, our guarding breeds. So our shepherds, our mastiffs, you know, great Pyrenees. So there are going to be certain breeds that if historically they were bred for guarding, well, resource guarding, guarding's in half of that word, right? Yeah. <laughs> and, and so they're naturally going to be a little more prone towards that. There are genetic factors that can come into play. You had talked about, you know, a litter of 10 puppies or so. And, and you know this, Amy, that you can have in that litter, if we were to do a bell curve, on, on one end, we may have some dogs that are really shy and timid. On the other end of the spectrum, we may have a dog that's extremely rambunctious. And we can have same breed. You know, people are always like, well, which breeds are more prone? Well, I talked about the guarding breeds, but any breed of dog, any breed of dog can be a resource guarder. Mm -hmm. And I will say that if right from the beginning, we've got a puppy that is insecure right from the beginning and, and we've all seen them, you've seen them, right? Mm -hmm. The puppy that's skittish, nervous, fearful, not so social. Those dogs are going to have problems across the board. And one of those things are going to be resources because resources they need to live. Mm -hmm. They need food. They need water. Uh, they need space to be able to have comfort. Yeah. There are dogs out there that have had a lot of trauma. You know, a large litter. Let's say we got a litter of 12 and, and we've got 10 nipples and we've got puppies fighting for resources right there. Yeah. Because the resource is scarce. And now take a runt or, or take a dog that's a, a little more withdrawn a little more shy, a little more fearful, a little more anxious because that's its makeup. And now there's more scarcity. Mm. Okay. And what happens is we also do certain things as pet owners, guardians, pet parents, that we make a lot of mistakes with our dogs. I yeah, we get a 100%. puppy. How many times does a puppy grab something it shouldn't have and run off? run off with it. It's and so it's cute. Fun. Yeah, it's cute and it's yeah. funny, right? The we get it on puppy video. Wants it. The puppy wants it. Well, we run and we grab it and we take it away from the puppy. So the puppy lost. Mm. We don't replace it oftentimes. Most, most of us know. Oh my God, he's got my remote. Boom. Let me grab that. Oh my God, he's got my glasses. Let me grab those. We never replace it. So a puppy that's, you know, kind of exploring the world, just a happy-go-lucky puppy. Mm-hmm. 
Mm -hmm. and starts grabbing things and starts realizing that, hey, every time I grab something, it gets taken away from me and starts to develop a little bit of protectiveness, starts to develop a little bit of possessiveness. Mm -hmm. And and that's just a normal, happy-go-lucky puppy. Yep. People that with good intentions, you know, sticking their fingers in the food bowl, taking the food bowl away from the, the dog or the puppy and trying to make a point and prove, hey, I can take the food away from the puppy. I can stick my hands in there. But creating situations where they're causing some level of discomfort. Mm-hmm. Okay. Resource guarding is about the fear of loss, the fear of losing something that is very important. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that can be food. It can be toys. It can be any object. It can be a location space. um, It can be um, a person. It can be another pet. Yeah. Inanimate objects. It It can be anything. I'm glad you said person because that's another thing that that crops up a lot is that and I made this I made this very mistake. We had a a lab who was, you know, brought up kind of isolated because we were in the I was getting out of the Air Force and we were moving from Colorado to Texas and so the dog spent a lot of time by by himself during formative time where he didn't get socialized. So that was a huge piece of it. But I remember thinking when he was a puppy at the time, but then a young dog <laughs> how cool it was when I would be walking my daughter in this, in the stroller and the dog would be walking and he would growl at people that came up. He's protecting us, you know? And, and I hear people say, Oh, he, he's very protective of me. He, he really loves me. Yeah. And it's mm-hmm. like, mm, you know, is, is he protecting you because he loves you or is he, you know, they don't understand what's really happening. And I didn't at yeah. the time either. And, uh, and it, well, all, it people, escalated I- into a good bite to uh my daughter in the face at one point so it uh, yeah and and you know yeah the dog may love them the dog may be protecting them but it's not altruistic mm-hmm. it's selfish the dog you know i that's why i get a kick out of um even today in 2024 people saying hey you need to you need to be alpha <laughs> even though we know that's bs we know that oh and a know, lot of people still garbage. think it We've oh, seen absolutely. famous and I people, tell people on TV say it. Yes, and so therefore, yes. But I tell pet owners, I say, listen, you feed your dog. Your dog doesn't eat without you. You provide water for your dog. Your dog doesn't drink without you. You provide shelter for your dog. Your dog doesn't have a place to live without you. Alpha, you're God. Yeah. <laughs> what are you talking about? You got to be alpha. You're already God to them. And this whole idea of, you know, you've got to show them who's boss. You've got to be alpha. No. Yeah. But despite that, right, that love that they have and everything that we provide for them, they can view. And this is the one thing that I think a lot of pet parents don't grasp. And I think aggression in general mm-hmm. is when a dog's aggressive and the pet parents like, but there's no threat. I don't see a threat. Dog does, there doesn't, first of all, there doesn't have to be a real threat. It can be a perceived threat. Right. And what one dog is going to perceive as threatening is going to be different than the next dog and the next dog and the next dog. Yeah. And again, pet parents, they, they're trying and they're trying to find logic and reason and use critical thinking for, you know, why is the dog upset? Why does the dog feel that it needs to attack? Yeah. Yeah, I've heard, I, I, I've even uh, in a situation where it's like a big dog, little dog. It's like, what's he so worried about? That's just a little chihuahua. And it's like, it's not the point. You know, the size no. of the dog is not the point. Whether he can no. take him or not is not the point. Yeah. yeah. So I think one of the things that's important when we talk about resource guarding, that we don't take on the thought process or the idea that my dog's a little jerk and he's being dominant. But that's the first thing that a lot of people want to think. And that's what, unfortunately, a lot of well-intentioned trainers that are out there mm-hmm. that you know promote that as well. It's my contention. No animal goes into fight or flight unless they perceive a threat. And if they're perceiving a threat, they're uncomfortable. They're nervous. They're stressed. They're anxious. They're fearful. 
It's that underlying emotional state that's the real problem. The aggressive behavior is a problem for the pet parent. It's a problem for anybody that, you know, is on the receiving end of that. But for the dog, that aggression is the dog's solution to the problem of, hey, I'm afraid that you're going to take my food or my toy or you're going to harm or take away my pet parent or this comfortable couch that I'm on. And as a result of that anxiety, they may start to display behaviors, right? They might start to yeah. growl. Then if the growling isn't heated, maybe they show their teeth. If that's not heated, then maybe they start doing some lunging or snapping. And if that's not heated, then maybe they actually bite. But think about what the dog wants. The dog is feeling threatened that it's going to lose that. And it feels that this is a very important resource. I'm going to lose it. I'm scared. So I want that threat to go away. Mm -hmm. I want distance and space between me, the scared dog, and that person or that other dog or other animal that I feel is a threat. And so all that aggressive behavior is very functional for the dog to try to get distance and space. And what typically happens? We go, whoa, whoa, we back off, right? Whoa. But these behaviors become functional. The dog wants distance and space. And oftentimes, that's just what's going to happen. It works for them to get distance and space. And when they can get that distance and space and that keeps on working for them, they're not going to give up that. They're not going to give up that behavior. One of the things that I have to do is educate pet parents on what negative reinforcement is. And that's the removal of something uncomfortable. That if we be, if, if a behavior causes the removal of something uncomfortable, that behavior has value because who wants to be uncomfortable, right? So if you are a dog or you're a person and, and I've got a resource guarding issue, I'm a dog with a resource guarding issue and you're coming near me and I want distance and space and I growl or I snap or I snarl or I do a, uh, a lunge and that, that threat that I'm perceiving moves away that takes away some of this uncomfortable feeling, this emotional pressure that I have is removed. Mm -hmm. Negative reinforcement is the removal of something uncomfortable. Pet parents would understand it about when you get in the car, all right? The, if you don't buckle up, there's a negative reinforcement uh, tool in there. Ding, 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 ding. It's ding, annoying. Ding, ding. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And as soon as you engage in the behavior that they want, that something unpleasant goes away, that ding, ding, ding goes away. And so aggressive behavior is used to create distance and space. And oftentimes it works for the dog and it reinforces and strengthens that behavior. And so they need to understand that these behaviors are getting reinforced. They're getting strengthened. The other thing that I have to talk to pet parents about is in the beginning, when they've got a problem and they want to address it, avoiding all the triggers. What does that mean? Well, if we've got problems with food, we don't put the dog in a situation where whether it be it's afraid of another person approaching it when it has food, whether it be another dog, we don't put that dog in that situation. And what I tell folks, I said, listen, if you called me and you said, hey, I've got a busted water pipe. First thing I'm going to tell them is not how to fix the busted water pipe. I'm going to say, hey, listen, I need you to go find that main water valve. I need you to turn that off completely. Because there's no fixing, there's no <laughs> fixing that broken water pipe when everything is just spilling out all over the place. Yeah. And it's the same thing when we have these serious behaviors that have these underlying conditioned emotional responses. Number one, we need to avoid those triggers so that we don't continue to condition the behavior we don't want. You know, repetition makes for conditioning, makes for habituation. And if the dog's going to continue to rehearse these behaviors day in and day out, well, we're never going to be able to get a handle on it. I should, have, I should back up for a second and say first, one of the most important things is safety and management, right? So 
avoiding those triggers, not only is it critical for the behavior modification process, but for management and for safety that, that we need to do that, especially when we're talking about the smaller breeds. A lot of resource guarding people think is funny. And we see on social media, we see these, you know, video clips, you know, of uh, these little dogs, you know, uh, being aggressive (laughs) and they think it's cute. Yeah. But it's not cute. And, you know, little dogs can do a lot of damage. Yeah. And especially if you've got kids, you know, then, then you've really got an issue. But having people take this serious with little dogs is important. The other thing is letting them know your dog's probably not going to grow out of this. This isn't something that just goes away over time. And usually those behaviors don't, but a lot of pet parents think, oh, it's a normal puppy behavior. It'll go away. Well, let, let me ask you this before, before we go too, too far, because I've been had this thought about the very first example that you gave of you yeah. know, puppy, puppy ran off with my headphones for my, yeah. you know, for my phone. Um, and, you know, chasing it around and turning that into a, now I've got the puppy cornered and I'm going to take it away from them. Uh, to me, that's the, that's the beginning of a, of a lot of that conditioning, right? So sure. an instance where it's a little puppy, I mean, how much damage could he do kind of thing? What should a person be doing? Like my thought would be, you know, sit down on the floor with something the puppy wants and get it to come take that and give it to that. And then, you know, he's either dropped the headphones or he's brought them back to me. Kind of like diversion. I used to do that with my daughter. It's like, if I told you to do something, you know, it would just be like, you know, if I couldn't get you to come over here, I, yeah, I could run after you and play that game. Or I could say, Hey, well, I'm just going to sit here and read this book by myself then. And then suddenly she's super interested in coming back over to me. (laughs) I'll I'll go back to what I said initially. And that is um, avoiding the trigger. So the first thing is, um, don't leave your headphones out. <laughs> Don't leave those things out. And, and especially if you know your puppy's starting to take it, you know, it's going to happen again, right? So yeah. puppy proof the house. But then people say, well, how long do I have to do that for? I don't want to do that. I, 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 you know, you're training me. You're not training the dog. How come I got to make things different? Why doesn't the dog just behave? You can avoid a lot of problems by picking these things up and not having them out there so that the puppy doesn't ever develop that. And one of the things that I think is absolutely critical, you know, when you're talking about, okay, when they grab something, you know, it's one thing if we put it up, but let's say we didn't and and they did grab something. You said, Hey, what do you do? What do you do? Well, the first thing that, that I want to do is be proactive with dogs when it comes to food, when it comes to toys, when it comes to spaces like crates and dog beds and things of that nature. I want to start doing a lot of trade out games proactively with the dog. And when I'm doing a trade out game, I'm trying to make sure that what I'm giving the dog, what I'm trading for, what I'm giving them has higher value than what I'm asking them to give up and allow me to have. Yeah, and so if they've got a steak in their mouth, they're not going to take a, a toy or a, a carrot. You know, right. Like, no, thank you. I'm, I'm happy with what I have. I want to create the experience proactively early on, whether it be a young puppy or if I adopted an older dog and maybe I don't know the history of that dog. I'm going to start doing lots of trade outs. Okay. So I might start with a food bowl that, you know, has a little bit of kibble in it and, you know, the dog's eating it and I may get the dog's attention and I may have a handful of chicken. And as the dog looks at me and gives up that food and thinks about moving towards me with that chicken, I might label the behavior of the dog, leave it. I did not ask for it. What if the puppy doesn't know? Leave it. I need to start creating positive associations with taking away resources. Mm. And I'm going to do that by doing trade up, giving something more valuable to the dog. And then some dogs are going to be more toy motivated than food motivated. Not, it's not right. always about food for every dog. Yeah. Um, and different foods are going to have different value. How many times have we heard... Um, a house that has multiple dogs, you know, they can eat next to each other, their food bowls, no issue. But boy, 
give them a bully stick. And now all of a sudden, you know, they want to kill each other. Yeah. So different food resources are going to have different values depending upon, you know, what they are for the dog. Every dog has what I call their chocolate. But I'm going to do a lot of proactive trade up games with resources. If I notice that, you know, I've got a new puppy or I've got a dog and, and that dog is wanting to grab things in its mouth. I'm a big proponent, Amy, of capturing. If I've got a dog picking up something I don't like, I know it sounds crazy. I'm going to label it fetch. I'm going to click and I'm going to reward that dog. When I can teach fetch, I can teach drop. I have more opportunity to teach drop because the dog will have more things in its mouth if I can ask it to do that. So I can be very proactive. Even if the dog has something in its mouth, I can begin to teach a behavior that can help me stop it. Maybe I transfer that instead of on the remote, maybe I roll a ball to the dog and the dog goes and grabs that ball. And as it grabs it, I go fetch and I click and reward or I mark and reward mm. over and over until this becomes a conditioned fun game and the dog understands fetches, pick up, and I get a reward. After a while, we get to reverse engineer that. Ask for fetch. And if we put enough time in, if our timing was good, the dog will do that. We can start getting fetch. Can we get them to clean now, the entire house that way? Like pick Oh, wouldn't up, that but... be nice? Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> you know, it's fun. I had a I had a Malinois years ago and we'd go to the park and, you know, we'd work on retrieving. And a big part of our retrieving was cleaning up the park. Go grab that and we'd go to the trash can and throw it in That's there. Great. We had a lot of fun doing that. <laughs> but with, with these dogs that we are working on proactively trying to prevent resource guarding. Being able, to, I think, to teach a dog to fetch and drop becomes a huge part of when they're grabbing something that you don't want. Dogs, puppies, they're going to grab things that they shouldn't have in their mouth. For me, it's a no-brainer that I begin to start teaching fetch and drop. You know, and I could do that, like, again, I could roll a ball. The dog picks the ball, fetch, yeah. and I reward the dog. And then I just become the most boring thing in the world and just freeze. And the dog's going to drop the object because I'm being so boring. And when it drops, I'm going to drop, and I'm going to reward. And I'm going to do that with benign objects and teach those behaviors so that when my puppy is grabbing something that it shouldn't have, I can say drop, it lets it go. And guess what? Something better is going to happen. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to bring out appropriate toys and we're going to play with those things too. I always tell people when, you know, they want to use that whole the dogs being dominant, wants to be alpha. I go, no, your dog's unruly. What does that mean? It means that they don't come into the world with rules. Mm. And it's our job to teach what those rules are. They're just being a dog. It's natural for a dog to just pick up whatever. Very natural behavior. You know, you ad addressed a lot of important issues in there, but I do want to, I want to tag back to, you know, we're, we're such a quick fix society. Yeah. And you had said at the very beginning, mm. um, you're not going to fix this. It sounds like this is a process of fixing it, making it better. But what do you mean by it's like, it's not cured, it's not fixed? Every animal is going to make a mistake. I make a mistake every day, whether I want to or not. I just hope I get it out of the way early in the day rather than later in the day. Mm -hmm. But dogs are going to make mistakes. And I talk to people when we've got these behaviors that we don't want. Don't think in terms of a cure. If we get a cure, if we can, quote unquote, fix it. Hey, that's fantastic. That's icing on the cake. Yeah. What I'm looking for is what is the frequency of the behavior when we had the problem? And now we're creating a training plan, behavior modification plan. As a result of that, are we de Increasing, are we seeing the frequency of behavior decrease? Mm -hmm. Are we seeing the severity or the intensity of the behavior decrease? If the dog is engaging in that behavior, is the duration shorter? Those are all measures to be able to take a look and say, hey, are we making things better? Mm -hmm. And to me, that's our goal, to always try to make things better, to mitigate things, to to modify the behavior, but not necessarily cure or fix. Mm -hmm. It'd be nice if we could get that every single time, but that, that doesn't always happen. And also being able to teach alternative behaviors. 
to dogs, okay? Because what do most of us do when we get frustrated with the dog? We we tend to go to punishment. Mm -hmm. And if there's one thing that is absolutely going to make resource guarding worse is punishment. Any aggression, it's going to make it worse. You are not going to fix aggression with force. When we use punishment, and, and some people won't use the word punishment, they'll say correction. But let me define that. Anything, anything that causes discomfort, fear, pain, intimidation, discomfort, even at a mild level, that's punishment. That increases anxiety. And that's at the root of the problem when we're talking about aggression. Punishment can temporarily suppress that outward behavior, but it, it's, it's short-lived. The only reason the dog is not engaging in that behavior is because it's afraid, oh, you're going to shock me again, or you're going to hit me with that rolled up towel, or you're going to toss a can with pennies in it that's going to scare me, or you're going to use a, a air, a compressed air sprayer, you know, or you're going to jerk me with the leash or something like that. Or you're going to yell at me and scream at me. Just to make sure I'm understanding. So, because it makes sense to me that, you know, when you're talking about, you know, trying to upgrade, you know, so if they've got something and so you're going to get a higher value thing that they love as a way to, you know, uh, to upgrade what they've already got and get them to give it up. That totally makes sense that the punishment, you know, it's like the punishment is of higher fear or anxiety. So if I have to choose between the two, I'm going to uh, try to avoid the punishment by stopping doing this. But like you said, once that's gone, I'm going to go right back to doing what I was doing. Is that that's basically what you're saying? Yeah. And I'm going to be more nervous about it. Yeah, because now I'm waiting for that to happen, too. Exactly. Yeah. It, it also teaches the dog. Yeah. Resources are scarce. Yeah. Look at this. You know, the, the universe is hostile, yeah. <laughs> you know, type of thing. Yeah. Um, validating that perception that, that there's a threat. Yeah, there is. Yeah. So in, I want to, I want to talk for a little bit about, um, like acquiring a pet. Cause one of the things that I thought about when I thought about that t litter of 10 puppies that we had is that, you know, there are probably things that I could have done and I sort of did it, but I only did it halfway, right? Because it was 10 puppies, but we have these large feeding bowls. And I always, from a common sense standpoint, would put out multiple bowls as opposed to, yeah, I could have gotten a, a horse trough and filled that yeah. with dog food and let them all dive into it. But it made more sense to me, multiple bowls. So there's two or three puppies here, two or three there. Would it make more sense to help not reinforce that natural behavior early on to, you know, give each puppy puppy its own bowl or to really spread it out like that? And, and let's say it's a smaller litter. Let's say it's four puppies or five puppies. And, you know, I'm, I'm, oh, this is a big enough bowl. I'll just throw this bowl out. But now that's the one resource that now I've got four competitors for and yeah. maybe I'm going to guard it versus five bowls or does it make yeah. any difference? I've also thrown food on the floor to avoid resource guarding because you can't guard what's spread out all over the place or it's hard. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now you bring up a really good point there. Okay. Because, and you were talking about a very large litter and imagine having one bowl and what was it? Nine or 10. You th there I think was you said 10 in that litter. 10. And, and, and they're puppies. trying to all get in there. I mean, how big of a bowl do you have? Right. Yeah. They're all trying <laughs> to get in there and fighting over it. And whichever one's the biggest and the strongest is going to win. And the smallest yeah. and the weakest is going to get, you know, pushed aside there. So yeah, having multiple bowls feeding in, in different locations. You know, something naturally that I've always done, and, and uh, maybe it's just because I just am so much into prevention. I've never had dogs that were resource guarders myself, but I've always fed them separately. Always fed them separately. Yeah. I've never fed my dogs together ever. I just haven't done it. It just made more sense to feed them separately. It's easy to do it. It doesn't take any time, doesn't take any effort. And they can't be fighting if they're fed separately in different locations. I hear it. And, and you probably hear this too. You know, I hear from uh, pet parents that say um, that have multiple dogs. Well, we got a problem because, you know, this one doesn't like to share. Dogs don't share. Yeah, I was going to say he doesn't have to share. <laughs> yeah, if they want to play together with that, that's one thing. But they don't share. Mm -hmm. That's not a normal behavior for a dog. Oh, right. let me give you my toy to play with. Yeah. Oh, and you give me yours. <laughs> no, yeah. that's not the way it works. Now, it's that funny. doesn't mean that they, you know, get into, you know, fights when they're stealing the toy from the other dog. Right. 
but it's about who has it. And that starts in puppyhood, too. I've got plenty of video of it doesn't matter if you have plenty of toys out. It's like once somebody's got it and starts yeah. playing with it, here goes everybody else. And then it turns into this game of chase of running around. It's like, why do you need to chase that? It's like over here. But and it's funny you said that, too, about the feeding your dogs, because it, even yesterday I go and I we've got five dogs in the house right now. My personal bulldog, my daughter's terrier, my chihuahua, uh, a blind pit bull and a really messed up French bulldog. That's uh, that we got. Those are so those are rescues. And so obviously wide range of sizes, behaviors, et cetera. Even the newer ones, even the fosters, when we get the food out, you know, sometimes I'll just feed them while they're all, and I've put a video out the other day, like giving them treats and they'll all sit there, but I'll do it by hand. I'm not going to put the bowl down and let them go at it. But when it comes to dinner time, once I get that bowl and it becomes obvious, this is not like a treat she's just going to hand out to us here. Everybody runs and gets in their crate. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. Even the even the blind one knows <laughs> to find her way back, and she gets herself in her crate because that's where yeah. we eat. And I don't, mm -hmm. you know, I don't lock them in necessarily because they eat yeah. pretty quickly. I mean, I close sure. the doors so there's a a semblance of a barrier, and I'm closed yeah. in here. And you know, everybody finishes, and then you don't have to worry about getting into a fight over something or somebody getting torn up. Exactly. And it's little things like that that are so easy. But is it a fix? No. It's management. That, that's a management strategy. Now, why do we want to go about trying to modify the behavior if we can just manage it? Well, because management can fail. Oftentimes it does fail. And if you've got a serious problem of resource guarding, meaning that, hey, I've got a dog that when it feels it needs to guard a resource, it'll bite. Mm -hmm. And it'll bite bad. Mm-hmm. We definitely need to be working on modifying that behavior because management can fail. Remember, we talked about making a mistake. I make one every day, whether I want to or not. Right. Um, and as a trainer, working with aggressive dogs, I've made the mistake. I've, I've thought, oh, I thought the crate was closed. Yep. So, you know, if I can do it, of course, an everyday normal pet parent certainly can fail with management. We're human. Yeah. We're going to make mistakes. We can make mistakes. Yeah. From a standpoint of a rescue, I mean, to be perfectly honest, uh, yeah. it's a constant struggle if I've got an animal that's, especially if it's an adult that is a resource guarder, to feel comfortable. Um, and I know you said, obviously, little dogs can do damage, especially to children. And that's where we yeah. get into these situations in rescue where it's like, okay, is it appropriate to say I've got a 10-pound little dog and it's a resource guarder, so we're going to... Adopt it out, but we're not going to allow, you know, we're not going to adopt it out to anybody that has children under the age of 10. You know, I mean, that's a, that's a management thing, but you're relying on even with the adult people, because I've, I've made the mistake once and I don't know that I want to make it again, but it was also, again, a little dog where there were behavior, aggression, behavior issues that I had gotten to a point where they were not being exhibited I transitioned the dog to the home, visiting them several occasions, teaching them what they needed to do. All was going great. No, no problems. A year and a half later, they're calling me up, you know, can you take the dog back or we need to put him to sleep because he's, you know, bitten my husband and my granddaughter and whatever else, you know, like six times, uh, you know, kind of thing. And it's like, well, first of all, why are you waiting so long to tell me yeah. about it and not doing anything about it? But mm -hmm. basically everything that I had taught them to do to avoid the behavior. I mean, I don't even know. It was it was almost even beyond management. Like it, it's just like we had it completely it, seemingly under control. But yeah. they basically then stopped doing any of those things. And it's yeah. like, well, yeah, obviously he reverted back because you're now – basically breaking all the rules that uh, that got it manageable. And then and then I think about okay, again, that's a little dog, is it going to is it going to kill somebody? Well, no, it's not going to kill somebody even if it, you know, it could again hurt a child, obviously cause some damage, yes, but it's not going to kill somebody. Now let's transfer that to an 80 pounds whatever dog that has the same issue. I would almost not want to adopt a dog like that out at all. Um, I already have a problem with the little one because I know human nature is not to keep up with the management. Or like you said, we yeah. fail, we make mistakes. And it's like, yeah. that's just too, too high stakes for yeah. that to come back on me when you tell me, you know, it mauled a child and now they're disfigured or worse. What, what, are, your, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I, I'll, I'll go back to what I said. Management fails. And I think when you're a, 
not, not just a pet parent, but when you're a parent parent, you've got kids. And, and let's face it, most parents, um, not only if they've got kids or they're raising their kids, but they're working outside of the home. And they've got a lot of stuff on their plate, a lot of things that they're doing. It can be exhausting for parents and it can be exhausting for kids, depending upon what their lifestyle is. Mm -hmm. Are they fully cognizant and are they, do they have what it takes to be able, you know, to manage, you know, that situation? So, I mean, ideally, it would be great if we didn't have to place any dogs that were aggressive in homes that had children. I think that. Because that's what. That's what we've done, and people will, I mean, we'll put very, and, and even if it's not like anything has really happened, we just know that, let's say, let's let's take aggression off the table just for a second, and it's, you know, just a big, boisterous dog that is not going to be a fit for a two-year-old, because it's basically mm-hmm. going to plow them plow them down on sure. a regular basis yeah. and be an unpleasant experience for everybody, and you yeah. make it really clear, like, hey, you know, this dog needs, uh, you know, adult owners, people who are active, people who exercise a lot, you know, not going to be great with, you know, with children under yeah. a certain age or size. And if it's pretty, if it's cute, if it's a breed that was just in a movie, here they come. The parents of people under, you know, under the age of five. And it's like, did you not read what I put there? So it's like, even when you try to protect people from themselves. It's tough. You know, it, and yeah, it's, it's, really it's frustrating. Tough. <laughs> it is. It's tough. It's frustrating. Yeah. We've even had people who have been denied for adopting for whatever reason. And then the next thing you know, they've got, um, and we, we, we dig, um, the next thing you know, they've got their mom, their dad, or some other person living at another address, conveniently applying for that same animal. So I'm going to go get my mom to adopt the dog for me so I can have it with my little kids that the rescue said is not appropriate. Yeah. You know, it's like, you can only save people from themselves so much. Aggression in kids. They don't go well together. I, I just, you know, I would prefer if there's, I would prefer a dog not go into a home if it has any type of aggression where there are children. And for me, um, you said 10, I, I kind of, I'm up at about 13, 14. A little bit. I'm, I want Even them a little better, older. Yeah. Bigger, the bigger, the, the less eye, con- the less at eye level. That's my always, my always think. That is a big and, thing for the dog, the but I, yeah, yeah, I want, I want the kid to be able to think a little bit abstractly and not just think in very black and white terms. And so, um, being a little bit older, I can get a little more of that from them. Yeah, good point. And I, I think it's a, you know, a, a lot of it too is a case by case. I mean, we, we do this with, with, especially with dogs. Yeah. I mean, it's not as much of an issue with cats, but there are exceptions to every rule. You know, there are 13 year olds that act like five year olds. Yeah, five, exactly. Well, you know, 12 year olds that act like 18 year olds or are physically yeah. large or whatever it might be. So, yeah. um, but I think that's a good ballpark in that age, you know, in that age range. Yeah. So the, the last kind of major thing that I wanted to ask about was, and you, you kind of already hinted at it, but it, I, I think people, it won't hurt anybody to hear it again. I've gotten this dog, um, you know, whether I ignored the behaviors early on and then it grew and developed into something that was a bigger issue. Because the other thing that I, I think people need to realize, and I've said it before on episodes with, um, with shelter pets and with rescue pets, I call it the 72 hour rule. That's not a magic number, but in my experience in bringing strange dogs into my home, no. that um, 90% of them seem mild mannered and look how calm, look how quiet, look how good, look how this, look how that, look how none of this, none of that is happening because they're probably because they're terrified and they have no idea yeah. what's going on. And Overwhelmed, usually yeah. in about 72 hours, you start to see their real personality. And I know, and I know there's some people that talk about the, you know, three, the three weeks, three months, three, whatever, you know, the pattern, but I, you know, things to me in my experience start to emerge at that point. So let's say that I get an, you know, an older adult dog, a, a, a bigger dog, whatever it might be. And I realize that this, this issue is starting. What would be the progression of steps? If they've got a problem, you know, the first step is what I call triage. And that means keep everything safe in the house. You do what you have to do to avoid the problem so that everybody's safe. After that, Take the dog to the veterinarian, your regular vet. Your dog needs to have a medical checkup. Make sure, rule out, there's nothing medical Mm -hmm. that is a contributing factor. Because training and behavior modification is not going to tackle medical stuff. Yeah. It's usually not the cause. 
Okay. But there's a good number of dogs that have aggression where there is a medical contributing factor. Could pain is always a big one. You know, if, you know, if I'm, you know, especially dogs that, um, have a favorite comfortable spot that have pain and you, another dog comes close to that, you know, they start feeling vulnerable and they start getting aggressive. So pain. You know, I read somewhere, and I don't know how they came up with the number, 11% of dog bites. The dog had a very painful oral conditioning, condition, you know, like a rotten tooth or something like that. And people going to pet, and, you know, the dog biting. Um, so we definitely want to rule out pain and, and things of that nature. And there's hormonal imbalances, potential neurochemical imbalances, you know. But those are the areas, you know, where we need to. And I think as trainers, as behavior consultants, we need to be educating pet guardians and pet parents that there is that medical component that we do need to rule out and make sure um, and address that as well. Right. Once the medical has been ruled out, then yeah. the, ne the next step in the process would be yeah. to find so a... Find a professional, professional, professional that can trainer. help you, okay? Yeah. You know, this is an industry that's unregulated, so you never know what you're getting. I, I tell people, you know, try to find somebody who's certified and find out where they were certified because there are trainers that are certifying themselves out there. I mean, it's kind of silly. Do they have experience working with aggressive dogs? What's their mm -hmm. success ratio? How do they work with dogs? You know, is this somebody that is using punishment to suppress behavior or do they really understand what real behavior modification is? One, the quickest way that you can find out if, if they really know what they're talking about or not, say, do you know what counter conditioning and desensitization is? And, and if the pet parents don't know, they, they need to learn because <laughs> when, it, when it comes to aggression, fears, phobias, anxieties, reactivity, it's all about counter conditioning and desensitization to modify that behavior. When you've got trainers out there that are using force, that are using aversive tools, what I have found is that the vast majority of them don't even know what that is. Mm. Their wow. idea of correcting the problem is punishment. But yeah, I think that anybody that's looking for a real experienced trainer or a behavior consultant, definitely. If they do group classes or if they do private training, ask, ask and see if they'll allow you to, you know, check out what they do. And maybe they're not comfortable with that, but I'm sure a lot of trainers have videotaped certain things and maybe there's something that, you know, they can watch mm -hmm. a session or something like that. Because a lot of my wealthy friends, they like to send the dog off to some place for a month and yep. then it comes back and you know, is that yeah. I, I'm always fearful what the heck's going on when you, when you're not looking. When it comes to aggression, which we could say when it comes to fear, you are not going to send a dog away for one, two, three, four weeks and have that fixed. This is what happens. Cause I, I, I get the calls all the time. They send their dog to board and train. The dog's been punished. The dog's experienced corrections. The aggressive behavior has been suppressed. The dog comes home and you say 72 hours. My time frame is 72 hours to two months. Somewhere in that time frame, the dog goes back to that behavior because nobody addressed the underlying emotional state of the dog, which drives that behavior. You punish, you correct that outward behavior. You're going to suppress that behavior temporarily, and you're going to make it worse because from the emotional perspective, it's worse. The only way that you're going to have permanence reliability and success is through the slow, gradual process that it really takes to modify behavior and to, you know, we talk about the word counter conditioning. Counter conditioning means, hey, the dog's been conditioned that whatever it perceives as a threat is bad and it's been conditioned because of that emotional state to behave a certain way and to behave aggressively. And that becomes over time a conditioned reflex they're not even thinking about it. it's just right. conditioned reflex well the new behaviors that we're trying to teach in and really the new um, emotional states that we're trying to create with those triggers and pair positives with those triggers has to happen enough times that it's an automatic reflex for the dog to go into that positive emotional state that takes a lot of repetition. Think conditioning, muscle memory. 
It doesn't happen in one, two, three, four weeks. It just doesn't right. happen. Let's say you board and train your pet, and they were doing everything in the yeah. appro- appropriate way. Once the dog comes home, it's now a different person, a different environment. You know, you still have to continue the process and yeah. continue. You know, it's not going to be fixed, and now you don't have to do anything. You want to be able to dance with your dog, and you don't want to take the dance classes. Yeah. You sent the dog to dance class. And the trainer, their dance partner, can dance very well with that dog. And the dog comes back knowing how to dance. But you don't know how to dance. Let's say that you're the greatest quarterback in the world. And you get traded to a new team. And the receivers on that new team are phenomenal receivers. You're a phenomenal quarterback. But for the first two months on that new team, there's all kinds of fumbles. There's all kinds of interceptions. It's not because you as the quarterback don't know what you're doing. It's not that those receivers don't know what they're doing, but you didn't practice together. You don't have the chemistry, the rapport, the, the communication that goes with being a team. And you and your dog are a team. Right. If they don't practice, if they're not taught how to practice and maintain it, and they do that, they're not going to have success. Right. And especially, here's the thing, too, what people miss out on, especially when it's the more severe behaviors and they try to send them to board and train, they weren't part of the process of taking crazy and bringing it down to calm. Mm -hmm. And so when the dog makes a mistake and goes into crazy... What do the pet parents do that sent their dog away? They throw their arms up in the air and they panic. Yeah. They don't know what to do. Yeah, they, they don't know. They don't know what to do. Yeah, they don't know how to handle that situation. When you've been part of the process of change, when the animal makes a mistake, you're in a much better place to be able to know what you need to do in a situation like that. And and you don't get that when you send the dog away. Right. Yeah, that's such a good such a good point. The one thing that I would add and. I'm not trying to criticize or beat anybody up, but I do see an area where there needs to be a lot of improvement. And if there was a lot of improvement in that area, I think would mitigate a lot of aggression, not just resource guarding. Mm -hmm. And that's breeders. Breeders working with those puppies early on instead of just housing them. Mm -hmm. And there's so much that breeders can be doing as far as exposing those puppies early on the things that they need to be exposed to that by the time they're 13, 14, 15, 16 weeks of age, it's too late. And they've already developed fears. You know, I hear people all the time. They say, well, you know, the dog's one, two, three, four. I need to socialize my dog. That window has closed. closed. Yeah. You are now dealing with counter conditioning and desensitization. You are now dealing with behavior mod. It's not about socializing. Your window was three weeks to 13 weeks, roughly. And so if you think about it, Amy, look, if most people are getting their dogs at eight, if they're, you know, getting a puppy at a young age and they're not getting an older dog or adopting Mm -hmm. eight, nine, 10 weeks of age, most of that window is closed. And and then they're scared to death because they're afraid that, well, if my dog doesn't have all the shots, it's going to die of parvo and distemper. So that little remaining time that they have, the pet parent has, They're scared to death to get the dog out. So the breeders could be doing a lot in terms of helping exposing dogs, puppies to a whole lot more. And I think if you are looking to get your dog from a breeder, understanding that not all breeders are created equal, so to speak. Right. And, you know, one other thing that that made me think about is the you know, how much of this preventative behavior, maybe it isn't related to aggression, but I know when we have dogs with puppies, we try to not have them go to homes until at least 12 weeks. But there's so much that happens in just watching the interactions with the mom and how she disciplines them and the behavior that she, you know, the the things that are, and then socializing and learning to play and, you know, learning to let go when somebody's screaming bloody murder that kind of happens in that, um, in that area, but you know, what about? Well, I don't know whoever that are came up with the, go at six weeks. Well, yeah, know? that's way too early. But even for me, I don't know who came up with the idea that the magic number was eight weeks. That's yeah. the beginning of the fear stage. Eight to twelve weeks is a fear stage of development. They're more sensitive. If if they experience something traumatic during that time, it's much more likely to imprint on them. And people are putting eight-week-old puppies on planes and flying them out. Yeah. 
Yeah, so I don't know where they came up with that crazy number eight. Yeah. So if people wanted, you know, if people were finding themselves in it, and I apologize for not, I, I don't know how I did not know that you did everything virtual. I, it ha, I, well, I, I do in person. It's just that for most people, it makes more sense for them to do virtual based on the problem, number one. And number two, um, if I'm doing in person, it really takes up three times the amount of time it takes me for virtual because of oh, travel. Yeah. And, and so virtual, I can uh, provide at uh, a better cost point. And, and so financially, it helps out a lot of people to be able to do virtually as well. You know, so I'm located in the Phoenix, Arizona area. I do see and I do work with people in person. But again, most of what I do is virtual. But yeah, if they're in the Arizona area, they can uh, find me on the web by going to phoenixdogtraining.com. And then if they're outside of Arizona, I've got a global website, dogbehaviorist.com. Oh, okay. And I do behavior consultations with people in and outside of the U.S. as well. And tell folks, you know, about your about your podcast. Ah, you yes. know, it's like, like what, yeah. what would they expect if they listen to your podcast? What kind of information are you providing there? Sure. So I don't know. We've got about 140 <laughs> some odd podcasts that are up there. And I've talked about just about everything. Everything I do, I try to make sure that it's evidence based, science based um, because I specialize and most of my clients have dogs that are aggressive, reactive, have fears, phobias, separation, anxiety, that kind of stuff. That tends to be kind of the leaning of, of the podcast. Um, mm -hmm. It's Dog Training Today with Will Bangura. And you can find that on just about any podcasting platform, I'm sure. You know, I do stuff on jump, nuisance behaviors, jumping, barking, pulling on the leash, you know, all the way up to resource guarding, um, human directed aggression, fears, phobias, like I said, separation, anxiety. So once a month, I'm doing a Q&A, a Facebook uh, live Q&A. Yeah, I saw that. Uh, That's great. This Saturday, 11 o'clock Eastern time, Facebook live on uh, the Dog Training Today podcast. Great. Great. Well, I'll definitely put links up in the show notes so everybody can see that. So I appreciate um, that. I mean, I, I could talk to you for hours because I have so many other questions that keep popping up, but I really appreciate your time. I think this is such an important subject for people to better understand. And I feel like what we, what you, what you've shared today should give people plenty, you know, plenty of information to form at least a foundation of being able to understand and identify and, you know, at least start the process of intervening before things get out of hand and become a serious, serious problem. So thank you so much for sharing your advice and your wisdom today with us. Well, thank you, Amy. I appreciate the opportunity to be able to share with you and uh, with your listeners. And hey, thank you what you do, because I can't even imagine working uh, with rescues. I mean, full time, like kind of you do in the shelters and stuff like that. It's exhausting for me just to be working with the clients that the few that I have, you know, that, that have uh, rescues. I just can't imagine that it's got to be very emotionally taxing and, and physically exhausting. Yes, it definitely is. It, and it, I tell people it's a labor of love and people take that as, you know, because I love animals. And, and take I my do. dog. <laughs> I do. I do. But it's a labor of love because I wish I could get paid to do it. <laughs> yeah. Because, because I'm not getting paid labor to do it. I actually, love, yeah, exactly. I actually have a real job uh, <laughs> yeah. on top of that. So I, I, I appreciate that. And uh, so for those of you who are listening, thank you so much for listening to another episode of the Starlight Pet Talk podcast. Please share this episode with your friends and family members, especially if you can catch them before they've even gotten a dog so that they can learn about this important issue and uh, avoid some of the problems that uh, those of us who've had to deal with them have had to deal with. So thank you so much for listening. Thanks for listening to Starlight Pet Talk. Be sure to visit our website at www.starlightpettalk.com for more resources and be sure to follow this podcast on your favorite podcast app so you'll never miss a show. If you enjoyed and found value in today's episode, we'd appreciate a rating on Apple. Or if you'd simply tell a friend about the show, that would be great too. Don't forget to tune in next week and every week for a brand new episode of Starlight Pet Talk. And if you don't do anything else this week, give your pets a big hug from us.